All right, so this video is going to be all about the different ways that you can use some of the data in your array. Uh, some of the different problems that you might come across when you actually are storing a whole bunch of things in your arrays and then you actually want to get some sort of value or solve some sort of problem out of that. We'll be talking about 8.4, 8.5, and 8.6 from the uh, focus on the concepts part of the textbook. All right, so suppose I have an array that has numbers. It doesn't matter exactly what type of number as long as they are numbers. Uh, we can assume that the array has size of greater than zero, although more than likely you'll have a size greater than one. But, you know, we want to make sure that this works for a size greater than zero. Uh, what we want to be able to do, if we have all of those n values in our array, is I want to calculate the average value of everything stored in the array. So how do we actually go about doing that? Well, the average of a group of numbers is you take the sum of all of those values and then you divide it by the number of values. So what we have to do is accumulate them and using an actual accumulator there, and then divide by the length of the array. We could also divide, you know, we could accumulate and count the values and then divide the accumulated value by the count of the value. But um, what we could also do is just divide by the length because the length is the number of values anyway, and that's a lot more simple than implementing a counter on top of an accumulator, right? So why don't we just accumulate the values and then divide by the length? Note that we don't want to use the highest subscript or the upper bound, right? Using the get upper bound method, um, unless we add one to it, but you don't want to use the highest subscript in division in order to calculate the average because that will be one too small. We want to divide it by the number of items in the array, which is the length of that array. So essentially what we're doing, we're summing everything up using an accumulator, and then we're dividing by the length. That is our game plan right here. All right, so here's a really simple do loop example of this. I have my accumulator variable, uh, double total, my index variable into index, which will help me um, actually go through the while loop. I start the index at zero and I get out of the while loop uh, once the index is equal to or greater than double values at length. Um, so that's pretty standard. I'm just doing a regular traversal. And in that traversal, I just add the current value at the current index into double total. And then I increase the index by one. And then at the very end, I calculate the average using some hidden double average variable uh, to be equal to double total divided by double values dot length, which is the number of items that I have seen. Um, I could also do double values dot get upper bound passing in zero, add one, all of that in parentheses because of order of operations. I, I could do that if I wanted, I won't. Um, I could also use int index because the last check of this condition right here will be when int index actually equals the length of double values. Uh, if there are five items here, um, then int index will be five after this last addition right here. And five is not less than five, so it doesn't go through the loop, which then means that down at the calculation of double average, int index is five. So I could use that instead of double values at length as well. I just like using length right here. It's a good uh, one for me to use no matter what, and it's self-documenting as to what I'm actually using. But that is an example of how to you uh, calculate an average using a do loop. All right, here's the for loop version of that. Um, int index goes from zero to the highest subscript, double values at length minus one or get upper bound or whatever. Um, but this uh, is pretty much the same, the way that I'm adding stuff to double total. And then the calculation of double average is also the same. And of course the for each version of this, which completely gets rid of the index, and I just say for each uh, double current value in 
double values. Uh, I just add that to the total and then everything else is the same. All right, here's another interesting problem. Uh, if we have an array of n numbers, uh, pretty much the same setup as before, how do we find the largest number contained in the array? Uh, how, do we, how do we figure out what the largest value from that array is, from all of the values contained in there? Uh, essentially what we have to do is search the array one value at a time. Uh, so we're doing another traversal. We're looking at every single one. But we have to keep track of the highest value we have seen so far. And then if we see something larger, we make that the largest we've seen so far. So, you know, the first index, right? That'll be the, or sorry, the, the first element in subscript zero will be the largest element we've seen so far. And then maybe the second, third, and fourth elements are all smaller, so we don't update anything. But then the fifth element at uh, index four is larger than the one at index zero. So then we update and we say, okay, the largest one we've seen so far is the one at uh, spot five, or spot f at L subscript four, the fifth element. That whole kind of thing. And then of course it's possible that the first element is largest and then everything else is smaller, which means we never update it. It's also possible that it is, every one is in ascending order, which means that we update it every single time. Uh, we also could have repeats, but we don't necessarily need to update it when we see repeats uh, because it's just the same number anyway. So really all we need to watch out for is if the current number is larger than the one, than our recorded largest so far, then now the new largest so far is the current number. That's the idea. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show off the for loop version of this um, for reasons I will explain in a sec. But what we have is I have my double, which holds the highest value uh, that we have seen so far. And then I actually go through every element of the array and then see if the highest is smaller than the current element. You know, at double values at int index. And if that's the case, if it is smaller than the current value we are looking at, then double highest, uh, I'll just update double highest. I'll set it equal to the current value that we're looking at. So then of course, you know, at index zero, uh, double highest will immediately get updated because we haven't seen anything yet. And then uh, after that, we only update it when the current value at the current index is higher than the highest one we have seen so far. So that is the idea behind our maximum array value problem, except for the fact that it sometimes breaks. So for example, let's suppose that double values is the array containing negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, and negative five. Note that double highest, I don't initialize it, but it starts at its default value of 0.0. .0 which means that double highest is higher than every single one of these values right here. And we can't cheat by setting it to negative infinity or anything like that, that is busted. Um, so we, we can't rely on the program as written. Double highest starts at zero, which means that it's higher than every single one of the values in double values, which means that we never enter the if statement. So that's a pretty massive problem because that could eliminate a lot, that could be a lot of possible errors. That could eliminate a lot of possible um, variations of double values where we can no longer use this program on them. And actually this same problem is why I don't do the for each loop because, um, well, I mean, I could, do the for each loop, but really the for each loop, we're still looking at every single one of these elements right here. If I just substituted in a for each loop, but kept everything else as is, uh, it wouldn't really make that much of a difference. Um, 
but there is a way to actually fix this problem. All right, so I have made two changes right here. The first thing that I have done is I have set double highest to be equal to double values at subscript zero. So the first element in double values. So double highest is already guaranteed to be a value in double values. And then the second thing I do, since we already know double highest is already set to the um, value at index zero, which technically is the highest we've seen so far because we have only seen index zero, right? Then I don't even need to check index zero again. I can just check index one. And when I check starting at index one and then going through uh, all the rest of double values, that just makes the job work perfectly because now we never have to worry about double highest being larger than everything already, like everything that's contained in double values. When in reality, you know, double highest started out as a value in double value. So even if double highest is still the highest value at this point, it's still a value in double value. So it's giving us, you know, at that point, it would just be correctly returning the highest element of double values. An example of this is that example I gave before, if double values contained negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, negative five in that order, um, double highest would start out as negative one at index zero. And then for the index from one to four, um, it would never be updated because negative one is higher than negative two, negative three, negative four, and so on and so forth. So it never updates, but it still exits this for loop as being the highest value inside of double values. And then of course it will work if the highest value is in any other position as well. But this base case right here, where we start double highest as the um, value at subscript zero of our array, that's what fixes this whole thing. Uh, so yeah, I could, I, I mentioned the for each loop, I could still use a for each loop right here if I wanted to for this particular problem. It would be redundant because I'd be comparing um, the double values at index zero to itself for one try, but you know, I could do it if I wanted to just for this very specific instance of the problem. All right, so now suppose I wanted to um, count the number of times that I've seen the highest value in this array. So I'm going to add a counter right here, int max count, um, and I'm going to add in some code to actually update int max count. Now, what I want to talk about is why I set it to start at one. Um, suppose double highest, uh, when I set it equal to the value at index zero, suppose that value is the highest value and it only shows up once. Well, we would want the count to be one, right? So that would be actually why I do it. I mean, when we set, every time we set double highest, that means we've seen a new highest value, which means that we should also set the count to be one because we have seen it. So that's the real reason conceptually why I'm doing it. But even out here, like I have seen the highest value at index zero. It's the highest I've seen so far. So I've, I've, it's a new highest. So I might as well just set that count to one because I've seen something that's higher than anything else I've seen before, which was nothing. So it still counts. But then what happens is um, every time the current value that we're looking at inside of our loop, um, Every time that current value ties our highest value, then I increment the counter by one. Otherwise, if the current value is greater than our highest value, if our highest value is less than the current value, then I reset the counter to one because I've seen a new highest value. So the number of times I've seen that new highest value is one, otherwise it would currently be the highest value, right? So this is the first time I've ever seen it. It has to be the first time I've ever seen it. So therefore I've only seen it one time. So that's what the count now becomes. And then I set the highest to this new highest value as well. 
Um, and then I continue on with a for loop. A for each loop actually does not work here whatsoever. It has to be a for loop. A for each loop doesn't work because I set the count. Well, okay, you can make it work, actually. You can make it work by setting the count equal to the first value at subscript zero. And then you initialize this count at the very top to be zero. And then you do the for each loop. Uh, it checks double highest against double values at zero, which would be the current value that it's looking at in the for each loop, because it does that redundant work every single time in a for each loop. But it'll say, hey, this, uh, this is equal to the highest number, so I should increment the counter, and then the counter goes from zero to one. So you kind of correct for it by subtracting one from the very top. So you can make for each work, but it's real janky. It kind of looks a lot cleaner when you do it like this, in my opinion. But that's how you would add that little nifty trick in. All right, so the next problem is sorting an array, um, which actually we don't have to implement ourselves. The, there is a method called array.sort, uh, which actually is a little bit like double.triparse or something like that, where this is a uh, array type dot sort. Um, but you type in array.sort and then as an argument you pass in the, your array that you actually want to sort and then it'll sort the array values in ascending order. So it, it's actually modifying your array. You're kind of passing it in uh, it's sort of a pass by reference rather than a pass by value type of deal. Um, but it sorts it in ascending order so that might be alphabetic uh, where you do A, B, C, D, E as you're ascending up the alphabet. That's how it sorts everything. Um, it uh, might be numeric, so going from low numbers to high numbers. Um, but that is how the array.sort method is working there. So, for example, if I declare some int scores array to have four integers, uh, 78, 90, 75, and 83, uh, Calling array.sort and then passing in int scores, um, this would then transform int scores to hold 75, 78, 83, and 90. So 75 is at index 0, 78 is at index 1, 83 is at index 2, and 90 is at index 3. Just like that. So it's kind of shuffling all of these around. It's not necessarily um, deleting or adding anything. It's the equivalent of kind of shuffling it. Kind of like those ball and cup games, but with just moving the numbers around into the correct order. There's another method that lets you actually reverse the order of an array, um, which is array.reverse. It works exactly the same as array.sort. You take an array, or you give it an array as an argument, and then it actually modifies that array in place. So it shuffles all of those items around again. So uh, if I take the same int scores uh, array that I showed off before, and I called uh, int reverse, it's going to take this original ordering and then reverse it. So the first element, 78, becomes the last element. 90, the second element, becomes the second to last. 75 becomes third to last, or second element in this case, and then 83 becomes the uh, first element. So all of the... Uh, just completely reversing the ordering, but it's not sorting. It's just reversing. So now our sorting, right? We already know how to sort in ascending order. But if we want to sort in descending order, we actually have to get a little bit clever because there's no one method that does that. What we have to do is we use array.sort to sort our array in ascending order and then array.reverse to reverse the ascending order, which then is essentially sorting it in descending order. So if we create our array of scores and we sort it the first time and we actually have to do the array.sort call in its own line just like this, this whole thing is its own statement. And then in the next statement, we actually reverse the same int.scores 
And then we have our descending order like this, where 90 is greater than 83, which is greater than 78, which is greater than 75. So this, this whole time, right, int scores itself, we're still using the same variable int scores. We're not setting the output of this equal to anything or anything like that. We're just using the same variable int scores, but we're changing everything in place. So after the first line, it is 78, 90, 75, 83. After the second line, it then holds 75, 78, 83, 90. And then after the third line, it then holds 90, 83, 78, 75. Note that we have to do sort before reverse. If we did reverse and then sort, what we would get is the same uh, reversed array that we had before, 83, 75, 90, 78. And then we would sort it, but sort sorts in ascending order. So then we would end up with 75, 78, 83, 90, which is not what we want. So we have to sort it first and then we reverse it. All right, so those are some examples of how we can actually use the data that's held in arrays get actually really useful information out of it so that'll be really key to actually using these effectively in programming